Hey everybody, it's Emily and Earl. We're here, we're just a little bit early for AR 101, uh, class number two. We're gonna talk tonight about clothing for an adventure race and also paddling in an adventure race. And everything we talk about is pretty much geared towards the Alpine Shop Castlewood eight hour adventure race that's coming up on December 5th. Uh, a little bit less than eight weeks away. So it's really like, if you haven't started doing a little bit of extra training, maybe this week would be a good week to start that. Um, just a you know, helpful hint, we're here for your enjoyment. Um, so we'll get going in a couple minutes, but overall just wanted to start our live stream and um, make sure everybody has a, knows that we're here. So um, I'm gonna assume that everyone can hear us if we can't hear us, just comment away. Um, or just give us a thumbs up. Right, yes. I'll have to get this side of things going too. Okay. Okay, we have a confirmed we can hear and see. So thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Um, and yeah, again, run like the wind did. You're here. Love that name. <laughs> One of my favorites. Because <laughs> that's what we're all going to be <laughs> feeling at the finish line is uh, no matter what place you are, we're all going to be, well, if the race finishes on foot, we're going to be running and we'll be winded as well. All right, so we'll just uh, give us a few more a seconds. Minutes. We have our watches synchronized. Uh, Pretty close. If I can get this like actually live. It's a little confusing. Right, I know. Just a few seconds, right, like 30 just, seconds right. delayed. Oh boy. That's why you just need to keep focusing on that and then Great. not look at the other one too much. We did it. Um, all right. Ding, ding, ding. Seven o'clock. Yeah. Uh, it's time for Adventure Racing 101, class number two. We had our first class last week. We talked about uh, navigation strategies and trekking, um, like gear you need for trekking, kind of what to expect. So if you weren't able to join us last week, we have that um, Facebook live stream presentation, whatever you want to call it. We have that class saved for you on, uh, it's on this Facebook event page. You can scroll down in the history and watch it. It's on the Alpine Shop YouTube channel, so you can see it forever <laughs> out on YouTube. Um, and then we'll do the same thing with this class, class number two tonight. We'll, um, once we're done, we'll save it on the Facebook event page for you guys to watch at any point in time. And then we'll also um, send it over to YouTube. Um, and it's, if you ever are bored or like want to hear this, the very similar material explained in a slightly different way, we have our classes from uh, 2018, 2018, and 2017 that are on the Alpine Shop YouTube channel. So. Um, it's like going to be almost over 20 hours of <laughs> AR 101 <laughs> once we're done with 2020. It's like a little bit excessive, but I mean, we like doing these classes and we think it's important and you guys have been so great um, with your response and just wanting to learn more about adventure racing. So thank you for tuning in. Um, similar to last week, if you have any questions during, the, during our little chat, Facebook Live, um, throw them up in the comments. I've got a separate screen over here that we'll get to. Uh, make sure any questions or comments are addressed um, right away. So feel free if anything, you know, you're curious, want to know more, we didn't explain it right, 
um, just throw a comment up on the live stream and we'll address it um, before the end of the show. Um, so, anything else? How's your leg? Want to uh, give your fans an update? <laughs> pretty much uh, not a lot of change this week. Um, maybe a little more time out on the uh, knee scooter uh, with the nicer weather this week. And uh, still more two, two weeks from today. We have another doctor appointment. Hopefully the cast will come off. So, not a lot of change. But, well, each day gets a little better. One more week down. Um, so if you guys see Earl out on the race course, make sure you know he's recovering from a broken fibula um, sustained over Labor Day. So just be nice to him out there. Be Hopefully willing. by the race I'm out of all devices yeah. and able to walk. Right. I'm That's the goal. That's, yeah, just, but don't have a running contest. Just do a walking contest, right. maybe. Right. Um, okay, so let's talk about paddling. Um, just kind of a brief overview of how paddling works at the Castlewood 8-Hour Adventure Race. Um, we, the race organizers, we provide canoes for every team. One canoe per two people. So a two-person team gets one canoe. A four-person team gets two canoes. Um, and then family teams will get one canoe per family. So depending on how the kids work out, you might have three or maybe even four people in a boat. But that's for family teams only when, you, when we kind of ask you to consolidate. Um, we, the race organization, provide you with paddles. They're single-bladed canoe paddles. Um, we do not allow the use of personal paddles. So in some longer adventure races, or just really any adventure race, it's always up to the race director. But especially in longer races, you'll see teams bringing their own paddles and PFDs. Um, but for the eight hour, the Castlewood eight hour, we just say, let's keep it an even playing field with the canoe equipment. Um, so we provide every team with the same single-bladed canoe paddle. We also provide you with PFDs. Um, and they're not, I mean, they're just rental outfitter PFDs. So nothing fancy, but they'll keep you afloat if you should need them. Um, let's see, anything else about the equipment? Yes, so uh, PFDs are mandatory yes. uh, to be wearing. It's not a uh, seat cushion. Um, we, uh, it's just every adventure race you do, um, it's not a float trip, um, PFDs are required to be worn at all times in and near the water. Um, so before you launch your boat, everybody's going to have to have their PFD on before they depart the shoreline. Um, just that's part of the rules and it's a dis disqualification if you do not have your PFD on. So just very, very simple, it's just a simple rule that you just wear your PFD in the boat. And just to be clear, if anyone doesn't know what PFD stands for, what is what is it? Uh, isn't that a file on the internet yeah. or something? <laughs> Personal flotation device. It is what we call a life jacket. PFD. So, PFD. Put it on, buckle the buckles, and only after all that's complete, hop in your boat. Um, okay, so that's what you will be um, paddling. So some tips for how to be a good paddler. Um, obviously, it's not something we can teach you like <laughs> from a basement via Facebook live stream. But here are just some things to think about when you're out practicing for the race, um, what you should be conscious of, what you're doing, um, and how to paddle well. So Earl, would you demonstrate? To the best of your abilities. To the best of my ability. So first of all, we're going through our gear closet, and we really don't have, unfortunately, we don't have a, it's kind of silly, but we don't have a canoe paddle here at this point in time. So the best we could come up with is a half of a kayak paddle that we put a T-handle on. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you carry a T-handle for races gonna, where you might need a... Just hold that up and you, against, that's a T-handle. Yeah. So I just pops in and out but you know just to kind of give you an idea this is what I'm demoing with the canoe paddle um, and I guess a couple things before about paddling is something you want to talk about before the race is um, who can steer the boat uh, if neither one can steer the boat we might want to start uh, talking about maybe looking at some YouTube videos maybe consider trying to find a boat and going to uh, paddle and practice a little bit. Um, so that's kind of an important detail to 
the straighter the line you go, the faster it's going to go. So if you've got a boat that's going down the river, like zigzagging <laughs> and taking like out a float a, trip, taking out boats <laughs> on the way, uh, you're not going to move very fast, and you might disappoint some other racers that are trying to get down, get going down the river. So um, determining who can steer a boat, um, the person that steers the boat normally sits in the back. That's that's best, um, and then um, pretty much you know. Whoever isn't steering the boat is going to sit in the front. Um, and then, you know, if you're one of us, the stronger paddling teams, normally um, your strongest paddle, paddle or your motor is normally in the front of the boat if you can work that, but it doesn't always pan out that way. Um, so, you know, but, you know, the main thing is to have the person in the back steer. The other thing is, is that how you weight the boat. You want the, weight, the, boat, the, the boat to sit as level as possible in the water not like this uh, not like that or so, sorry i'm gonna pretend my arm is a canoe and it's trap your paddle it's being paddled downstream towards earl's head hey, hey, hey. uh you got your front person up sitting in the front and your rear person sitting in the back steering you want to kind of balance that weight so that if you're like this you're going to be pushing a whole bunch of water in front of you and working extra hard. Same thing if you're like this, you're going to be plowing through the water and working extra hard um, to make progress down the river. Go ahead. So you want to keep it level, the, the most level you can. And, you know, there's ways to work around that. So if you're, if, if there is an imbalance, maybe you just put all the packs where you need to add the additional weight, not you know, not that a pack makes a big difference, but if you just kind of move those around a little bit, you're gonna to want to try to fasten them in the boats just in case you do go over. You don't want to have a yard sale going down the river, um, you know. And um, so, just those kind of things are something to keep in mind um, and to make your life a little easier. And then. Um, yeah, so I guess it's really hard for me to kind of demonstrate a paddle stroke, but you know, basically you're gonna to wanna to have your top hand on the top and then, you know, you're gonna be, this is really short, but you know, you're gonna be a little bit over shoulder width apart. And the main thing is just to get, to reach forward and then just pull all the way through and try to keep your line along the side of the boat as straight as possible. And then you're gonna to wanna to use, you know, kind of your whole body to generate that stroke. Um, a lot of people think paddling is just all shoulder and arm strength. And basically you wanna to try to use your whole, the whole core of your body to pull that, um, pull the water and move, push the boat forward. Um, you know, and just kind of have a very even cadence. Um, you know, and you might wanna talk up your your switch techniques, you know, some people are like every three strokes they want to switch or, you know, it, switch every, what? Oh, we're going to want to switch from left to right. <laughs> so, so you kind of, to kind of keep the boat going straight, you're going to want to have to, you're going to both, have, you know, pat, one's going to paddle on the right, one will paddle on the left and you're going to try to kind of keep the person in the back will kind of have to manage maybe with a couple extra strokes, one side or the other to kind of keep the boat, um, going forward. Um, and then you're going to want to switch sides. Otherwise, you, if you, the more often you, if you can switch left and right, you're just going to keep a more even speed. So you're wearing out both, you, both sides are getting just as tired is probably the easiest way to explain that. So mm -hmm. um, we did have a question just now from Katie. Uh, so Katie wants to know the million dollar question that we all want to know before the castle at eight hour is, what do you think the million dollar question is? Bikes and boats. Yes. Will you be required to carry your bikes with you in the boat? Um, it's not a hundred percent sure right now because we're still waiting on our final permit approval. Um, but most likely, yes, you will have your bikes in the boats. Let's see if we can hear like groans of Race. adventure racers everywhere. like. So that's just another layer of um, challenge that we like to throw at racers, specifically because we have a, a river paddle in the Castlewood 8 Hour Adventure Race, so you, it's a point-to-point -point segment, and it's just not possible for us to physically move everybody's bike from the put-in of the paddle 
to the takeout uh, fast enough to make sure that your bike is ready for you when you're finished. Um, so yes, you will be having your bikes in your boats. Um, that will be something that is good to practice or uh, we'll have, we have lots of photos of lots of different strategies um, to put your bikes in your boats. So um, some people like to do, they take their front wheel off and basically set both bikes for the two people in the canoe, they set the two bikes in the canoe kind of upright and that keeps everything nice and compact. Um, another strategy is to actually leave the entire bike to completely together and stack it on top of the gunnels of the canoe. Um, that one's really tricky because oftentimes a handlebar or something will be dragging in the water that throws off the balance of the boat. Um, and then it's just really hard to get a nice clear, you know, area for everybody to paddle in. You know, you need nice, a good amount of space on either side of each paddler. So it's kind of tough um, to make that happen if you just flop the bikes on the top of the boat, but it is very fast. Um, so those are probably the two main strategies that we see. Um, ideally, you'll want to avoid taking off the rear wheel just because that takes um, more time um, than other strategies of fitting the bikes in the boats, but um, it's a good idea to think through it. Um, people have had a lot of success with different um, like tie-down methods or what else have you seen that's... Well, yeah, you know? I mean, the thing, the thing is, these, the best thing is just to do is just kind of visualize it and if you have a boat, just practice it and try several different ways. The other thing is, is you're actually, once you have them all loaded and you're like, yeah, I got this, this is amazing. You're gonna wanna sit in the boat and try to do a couple paddle strokes. So you just make sure that all of a sudden you don't have a handlebar in the way or a, you know, a fork that's jabbing you in the back. Uh, you know, it's just all those things. And um, we have done in the past where we have an AR, the AR 201s, we've been able to bring a boat Mm -hmm. um, so that people, if you don't have access to a boat, you could come to the 201 and bring your bikes and just try to uh, fit that in. So more to come on that, but um, I think normally we've done that at our second AR-201. So we'll see if we can't um, get a boat so people that don't have access can come and uh, practice that skill as well. Yep. Um, and if you're in St. Louis, just bring your bikes to the Alpine Shop Kirkwood where we have I hope we have canoes on the shelf. I haven't seen them, um, but that's another option too. If you need, if you want to have some hands-on practice, um, just bring it to the Alpine shop, and they'll let you practice with yeah, one of the if, canoes. Yeah, if if you want to bring them to the Al, if you want, if that's something you want to do, would probably just the best is to email us, mm -hmm. and then yep. we can reach out and try to help schedule a time just to make sure that we have uh, some staff members that are available. Um, and an in-stock canoe. And, and we are... have a, I think there's some demo canoes there, but I don't know for sure. But uh, email us if that's something you want to do, and we'll see what we can do to make that happen. Cool. Um, okay, other paddling tips. Don't stand up in the boat. <laughs> Great tip. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Stay that, seated. Stay seated. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is, is... Uh, you know, the river levels, we're always worried about them being too show, too low, too high. All of a sudden we get a bunch of rain the week before. Um, normally it's a pretty straightforward forward paddle. Um, the river level is normally, you know, if you do have issues, if you can't stand up where you go in, you float for a little bit and you can stand up. Um, the river is normally not that deep. Um, and just kind of look for obstacles and call them out. Um, the person that's in front, make sure you that the, the person in the back can always see what's coming up. So when you uh, see an obstacle, make sure you call it out. And then, you know, if we need to go left or go right, um, just kind of be eyes up front. And then also talk loud enough so that the person behind you can hear you because actually you're talking forward. And if it's windy or something, the sound gets kind of lost as it goes back. Um, so make sure you just kind of practice that communicate communication skill is also very important in a boat. So, um, just kind of talk through that as well. Yeah. Usually when Earl and I paddle together, I'm in the front and he's in the back and I was, I'm just going to demonstrate. I was like, this is the way that I'll be paddling. Can I actually like pretend to paddle here and, you know, 
I'm paddling along, do do do, and I was like, oh, rock, straight ahead. But my voice carries this way. And sometimes he can't hear that depending on what the noise level of the um, river is doing. So when you're paddling with someone and you're in the front and you see an obstacle, make sure to at least like turn your head to 90 degrees to help your voice carry a little bit back there. Um, and then be as kind of specific as you can uh, with describing what's going on. What we usually do is use a clock system. So we'll say rock at two o'clock or tree at nine o'clock. And that kind of helps describe to the person in the back where to look for uh, a certain obstacle in the river. Um, this section of the Merrimack that uh, we typically use usually has a couple trees, you know, semi-submerged um, based on the water level. So there is something to look out for. Um, but the river itself is, I mean, a grade one. Yeah, I would like, say, you know, the thing is, is most years the river is more challenging just because it's too low than too high. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we're, I guess, you know, it's kind of probably on the shallower side, but a lot can change between now and December. But um, we'll, we'll continue to monitor the levels as we get closer to the race. Um, okay, question from Michael. Bikes in boats is spooky or scary. Um, it can be, yes. If you are, what we worry about the most when we have bikes in the boats is uh, teams that are trying to go fast and they're not taking just even an extra 30 seconds to double check that their bikes are securely in the boat. Um, so that's where we see the most uh, like risk of losing a bike is when teams are trying to rush through the transition of the putting in to, putting their bikes in the boats and then the boats in the water and starting paddling. Um, so we, just the biggest advice uh, that we give everybody is just take your time. Um, take an extra 30 seconds, take an extra minute. Um, it might seem like an eternity, but it's really not compared to you know, the ultimate bummer of losing a bike. Um, we really haven't lost any we've not, bikes. We have not lost, we have not lost a bike. We've not Knock lost a wood. person. We've not lost a paddle or a PFD. Right. We have had to, uh, we've had a couple boats last year that kind of got away from people, but, um, a boat is recoverable. Um, they normally end up going to shore and, um, we can get those. The biggest thing is, is we just, you know, if you do go over, we need to make sure that you do what you need to do to get to shore. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have some safety boaters out there. Um, but, you know, pretty much anywhere you're at in that river, you're probably less than 50 to 100 feet from shore right. in most cases. Yep. Um, so you can get to shore. Um, and then, you know, I guess the nice thing about the adventure racing community is everybody is concerned and will help each other out so if there is a team that does have some issues and most teams will normally if there isn't a safety person around they will help to um yeah actually that's help. a that's a penalty if you see a team that is in danger and you ignore them like that's a penalty and we don't support that kind of behavior so um if you're out there and you happen to see a team that's struggling and no one else is helping them um, that's on you to slow down a little bit, see if they're okay. They might say like, yeah, we're wet and cold, but we really got this, we're fine, and then you're free to go on your way. Um, and we're happy to work through time credits or anything like that for teams assisting other teams um, in need of assistance. Um, anything else on paddling? What else have we have written down? How to read the river. Should you go on the inside of a turn or the outside of a turn? Uh, follow the bubbles. Hmm. What do you mean by bubbles? So the current, as it's going down a river, will normally generate, you can, if you look hard enough, you can normally see it, but sometimes you can see like just a little bubble or a little swirl, and that's normally gonna show you the fastest line. Um, and, you know, tr or if you just look at the, the river banks, the tall, steep, sharp edge is normally gonna be the cutting edge or the faster edge of the river. Whereas if you have a sloping gravel bar on, on that side, that's normally gonna be your potentially shallower waters and, and slower 
slower waters. Um, you know, uh, it just depends uh, with what we're going to have. Sometimes the river is pretty fast and the, the flow is pretty easy to see. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of a short lesson on reading <laughs> the river. It's a little bit counterintuitive when you're looking at a river and, you know, you want to take uh, the shortest distance from point A to B and you think that's going to be the fastest. Um, so obviously around a curve in a river, the shortest distance would be on the inside of that curve. Um, but actually, as Earl just described, that's where the slower water is. There's not as much current. It's usually pretty stagnant. Um, so what you want to look for is actually longer as the crow flies distance-wise on the outside of the curve, but you're, you'll be gaining the assistance of the current. So if you stay on that outer bend, um, you'll actually be working with the current to help sling you around that corner. Um, as you're pedaling along, so you'll pick up a little bit of extra speed. Um, so that's just something to practice is when you're on a river, um, looking for the outside of the bend, as long as there's no tree or rock or anything like that, um, take that outside line for a little bit of free current speed. Um, I think we covered most of it. I think that's most of it. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you want to learn more about paddling, there's plenty of resources out there. Um, you know, but for the most part, for your eight hour for this race, it is pretty straightforward and just kind of be patient and relax. If anything, right. if, any, if, <laughs> if anything starts to shimmy, shake, wobble or wiggle, the best thing to do is just don't grab the side of the boat. Just like things are kind of, just, your instinct is to grab but what you really need to do is keep paddling because that'll help your boat stay balanced and just, work through that. Just kind of keep paddling, but just relax your core. Mm -hmm. and just kind of let everything decompress and then the boat should normally just quit it shimmering and you'll think things through on how to get out of wherever you're at. Yep. Um, okay. Any... All right, looks like we're good on comments. Uh, thanks everybody for chiming in. Hi, Nathan. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a question from David. As kayakers, is there anything we need to do different than in a canoe? Good question. Um, I would say the most obvious difference is you'll be, you know, you'll have a single bladed paddle for the canoe um, versus the kayaking paddle, which is a double blade. Um, so that's a little bit of difference. Um, but really, oof, really there's not, I mean, just the skills that any kayaker has of reading the river, understanding where the fast water is, knowing how to avoid obstacles. Um, that's really the key skills that transfer over from kayaking to canoeing um, to make your paddle as enjoyable as possible. Um, just something that we remind everybody, you know, this is, it's a really, it's a very important race to us. Um, we love hosting all y'all, um, but it's not the Olympics. Like nobody's making a living off of winning the Castlewood eight hour adventure race. Um, and it, so an extra, you know, couple deep breaths if things get dicey, um, especially like we mentioned when you're putting your boats in the water and getting your bike set up. Um, just take a couple deep breaths, double check everything that's good, is gonna make the whole trip. Um, and then enjoy the paddle. It's kind of fun. Um, take the load off your feet and give your arms and core a workout um, while your feet take a break. Um, I think we have one more question. Oh, good one from Mark. Should we tip over? What sort of waterproof bags would you recommend to keep your gear dry? We have a whole slew of them. Do you want me to? I'll get the. There's one right up there. I'll grab some. But take it away. What, what would you recommend? I'm just grab that one right there. And... So normally, it's what we would use. It's just a waterproof bag like this. And you just put your clothes in it, and then you just wrap it over. You kind of get the air out of it, and then cinch it there. So pretty much anything that I would put in this, uh, like my fleece, 
If I'm, if I'm not wearing my, any clothes that I'm not wearing, I would put it in this. Um, any food items, you know, if they're not wrapped properly, um, mm -hmm. I would do that. And then I normally keep a med kit and the phone and all that kind of stuff um, in another one. So normally in my pack, I probably have up to two to four of these of individual things. And I just kind of break them down into different things. So I'm not like surf surfing through one big one that's got everything in it. So it just, it's a little easier to manage. Um, so just some people like to have one big dry bag and then put their whole pack inside of it too. But I just, it's too much to manage for like these short races. Um, so just the small little ones like these um, are super helpful. Or if you want to rely on just a Ziploc bag, you could, but I don't know that I'd really recommend that for some of the critical things. Um, so that's what I've done for many, many, many years, and it's worked pretty good for me. And then one other thing that Earl mentioned earlier is uh, <laughs> when you get in the boat, just take the um, clips on your over just take the clips on your um like waist belt if you have one of those on your backpack and just clip that around one of the um uh gunnels in the canoe um just so that if anything did happen and you flip then your stuff uh like earl mentioned earlier then your stuff's still attached to the boat um and it won't you know float down the river without you um and we do i mean we do have people flip i think last year Last year, our takeout was pretty fast, the current at that particular boat ramp, so um, it was a little bit more dramatic than normal. Um, but the, it, it just, it happens, and if, it, if you're one of the lucky people that flips, um, just the same thing applies is just take a deep breath, um, get yourself to safety, don't worry about your gear. Um, if we can retrieve it, we will, and if we can't, our most important um, priority is making sure that you're, you as a person are safe. Um, and then uh, if you, if, depending on what the water temperature is like and the air temperature, um, that's why we require a waterproof pants and waterproof jacket, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and those two pieces of clothing are going to be your most useful items to put on as soon as possible and help retain some of your body heat um, to make sure you don't get too cold. Um, so yeah, if it does flip over, if you do flip over, um, it just, it happens. Um, and if you're at a TA, our volunteers will help. Um, or our, if you're near our safety boaters, they'll help you. Um, and then uh, if you're by other teams, they'll help you too. Um, okay, let's get going to clothing. Um, let's go through, we're gonna run through the um, required gear list real quick. We have made a few changes to the gear list in 2020 that I wanna make sure to highlight. They're actually changes uh, to make things a little bit easier to manage. So we actually took away um, some items of gear that we, items of clothing that we have previously required, um, mostly because uh, we just wanna make sure that, you know, we wanna make sure everybody's safe and prepared to do an eight hour adventure race in December. Um, that's always a little bit tricky time of year with regards to the temperatures. Um, but we also wanna make this, you know, we don't wanna have you go spend a thousand dollars on gear that, you know, it's your first adventure race and you maybe not, are not sure that you want to do these after your first one. Um, so we've pared down the gear list just a little bit and we want to run through that. Um, so, and we'll kind of talk, if there's any difference between men's and women's uh, gear items, we'll talk through that as well. Um, okay, so first thing is a wool or fleece or synthetic hat. Um, baseball caps are not allowed. A buff is acceptable. Um, so what that looks like... Baseball hats are allowed. You can wear a oh, baseball yeah. <laughs> hat, but it just doesn't count as anything. But if you're used to wearing a baseball cap, you're welcome to wear it as far as I'm concerned. Very good point, yes. Um, so something like this nice little fleece hat that was part of our um, race swag last year, that would be a great option. Um, another knit cap, uh, that would be a great option. Oh, uh, what else do we have in here? I have one more. Um, oh, and then here's a buff. So, you know, buff is the tubular piece of fabric made famous by uh, our favorite Mark, our second favorite Mark Brunette show, Survivor. Um, these work as a hat, headband, um, depending on how you fold them. So 
Um, any of these items are just good for have on your head. Um, in case it's really super cold, you might want two, but in general, you just need one for the mandatory gear list. Um, fleece long sleeve top. You want to run through that? Yep. Ta-da! So just you, this is this is a hundred weight fleece, so it's There's another option. So they're pretty they're pretty light. Um, you know, you don't need the big bulky heavy fleece, but we do need something as an insulating layer. Um, so it, it's, it's hard for you to feel and touch this via the computer, but, um, it yeah, feels just, so soft. just a basic, you know, hundred weight fleece is what we're looking for. Um, if you have questions, so how we've handled this in the past is normally we just deal with it at a class or at registration. If you're like, I got a fleece, but I don't know if it really counts or not. Uh, you can email, you can take a picture of it and email it to us or a SKU number from whatever manufacturer it is. We can take a look at it. If you want to know before that, otherwise just bring it to however we're going to do pack a pickup the night before. Uh, we can take a look at it there and maybe bring it, if it if it gets to be that close to race day, maybe bring a couple options that you're thinking of. Um, but, you know, we just, this, if it's cold, this gets to be a very important item in your gear arsenal. Um, it just really helps, helps you maintain some temperature uh, if it is cold and between Long, steam, long sleep base layer, a fleece, and a rain jacket, you can really endure if you keep moving some pretty cold temperatures. So mm -hmm. um, this is probably one of the more important things. Um, and another thing list. to look for, uh, both of these fleeces have a quarter zip top, so you can zip this all the way up to have like a turtleneck top, or uh, if you're warm, then you can kind of unzip. Um, anything with these zippers, like this quarter zip or even a full zipper, um, is really nice to help maintain your body temperature. Um, it, it's a really challenging thing to do a short, fast adventure race in December if it's 20 degrees or 30 degrees. Um, so anything you can do to kind of dress warm at the beginning, but then also have an option to regulate your temperature throughout the day. Um, and of course you can always stop and take this off, uh, but that's just a nice option to have is that zipper um, to help yourself stay warm or cold depending on your activity level at any point during the race. Um, all right, next is the waterproof jacket with a hood. So we've got a couple different examples here. I'm just showing you, I guess I could put this on, um, just showing you the hood option. Um, we want something that covers your <laughs> want something that covers your whole head. Um, again, for the heat retention aspect, this is um, you know we just we designed this gear list for people if they flip over their canoe and they're soaking wet, what is going to help them get through that uh, trial? So um, a fleece and a rain jacket with a hood is you'll make it. Um, well, you'll make it. So uh, yeah, just any. Rain jacket, there's, you know, you can spend a thousand dollars on these. You can spend $20 on these. Um, that's just, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for, um, with this stuff. And you're never really going to have a truly, truly waterproof jacket. Like it kind of just doesn't exist unless it's a garbage bag really. Um, but like Earl said, you get what you pay for, uh, with the rain jacket, breathable waterproof technologies. You gonna put yours on? Well, I was working on the hood. Oh. I want to do the rest of the video like this. <laughs> um. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, and that, the next uh, thing on the mandatory gear list is waterproof pants or rain pants, sometimes as they're known. Um, so this is when I started adventure racing, I like had nothing on the gear list. I just didn't have those kinds of things in my pre AR life. Um, so this is something that I had to purchase. And again, uh, you get what you pay for. So we're looking for a full length waterproof 
pant. Um, this is like a, you know, one of the waterproof breathable materials. Almost every outdoor gear brand has their own proprietary material. Um, but just a nice waterproof pant. Make sure that the leg openings down here are big enough that you can put this on and off while wearing your shoes. Um, just something to check out in the store. We're not going to laugh at you if you go it, to... <laughs> if, if it doesn't, it's not a big deal. You just take your shoes on and off. Right. Yeah, that's it's, true. It's just, it's a convenience factor to have a larger... Some pants are going to have a full length zip all the way up. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, most common, it's a zip from the ankle to the knee. And that allows you uh, to potentially be able to get your pant legs over your shoes without having to take your shoes off. But, you know, that all just depends. And if you have really big feet, probably not going to happen. Um, or if you have larger shoes on, probably not going to happen. But it is uh, a nice feature. And, you know, for... Um, Basically, you can get a nice pair of waterproof pants and a nice waterproof rain jacket for about a hundred dollars, um, and that's going to get a good, get you a decent quality. And you know, maybe if, if you might just do one adventure race, but you might be going to a tailgate or you might be going to a concert, and you're like, oh, maybe I need. It might be good to just throw that in the car, and then you, you've got it for other things if you just decide if you if you decide that you, adventure racing isn't a thing, but. Get your team colors when if, you're shopping. If you if you do end up needing it, though, it'll be one of the best purchases that you'll glad that you made. Yes. All right, it's getting a little warm, so I'm gonna at least unzip. Um, okay, next is gloves or mittens. Um, I've got an example, but I like to. They were on the side of the table. Your gloves. Oh yeah, you're right. What I like to do for gloves is actually these like very, very generic, basic fleece gloves, like not branded. They're just like fleece dog walking gloves. Um, but I just find that gloves are kind of the same as uh, raincoats. Like they just like sometimes they over promise and under deliver, um, if that's like a polite way of saying it. So uh, just some basic fleece gloves will keep you warm. Um, a good strategy that I've seen a lot of teams use is having multiple pairs of gloves for uh, certain sections of the race. So, um, cause this, you know, your hands get sweaty if you're working really hard. Um, so having uh, maybe one pair of gloves to start and then if they have maybe a second pair for a biking leg and then a third pair for a paddling leg, um, that's just an idea. If you have multiple pair, multiple pair of gloves, don't be afraid to bring multiple pairs. Um, and just a nice pair of dry gloves starting a paddle is just pretty well, heavenly. Well, I would I mean, you might think that, but they're going to get wet really fast in a paddle. So the best, the best thing is just to have a dry pair of gloves, in my mind, as you come off the water. Um, if there's a way to have yourself set up to have dry gloves after the water. And the other thing is, is that um, if it is a colder day, a lot of people will use the, one of the recommendations is um, carrying some of the, the chem warmers and just have those inside of your gloves. Um, those are very helpful. Or uh, using like a latex glove liner inside helps as kind of a vapor barrier and um, We'll just kind of keep the, the actual glove out. We'll kind of waterproof what might not be a waterproof glove, and it'll help you to retain um, some body heat. And, you know, remember we carry a couple pairs of those too with us. Um, a shower cap is another thing that you can use to help retain some heat if it's a cold day. Um, and those don't cost hardly anything. Great. Um one more kind of option if you're biking and uh, maybe you have some of these already, maybe you're interested in purchasing a cold weather biking glove, these are the lobster mitts. So they have uh, kind of some separated fingers but still a mitten style so that you can uh, grab your handlebar, break a little bit, but also still you know keep a hold of your handlebar. Um, and yeah, so this is just another option too for biking in cold weather is this lobster style mitten. 
Um, question from Mark, do you recommend waterproof, waterproof gloves? If you have them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, or, um, you know, sometimes uh, we've used neoprene gloves um, for a paddle section. And you, can, you can wear a neoprene, I mean, it's really cold. If you want to wear a neoprene glove all day, you could. Um, you know, I guess, I can't say I've ever had a pair of waterproof gloves to know how well they really work. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, if you've got them, great. I wouldn't go make it, you know, again, it's, if you have them, great, but you wouldn't have to go buy them. Yeah, I would say if it's gonna be really cold, and by really cold, we mean, we're from Minnesota, so this sounds silly, but it really is true. 30 degrees and under for Missouri is really cold. Um, Really the most effective thing to keep your hands warm is those chemical hand warmers. Um, You can kind of bust out a couple pairs during the race, and they really help you know with that heat generation by your fingers um, to keep them warm um. and, and they're not you know the thing is is like these gloves here are great but when they're wet they're heavy and they're not warm whereas if you have a light fleece glove like this that doesn't weigh a lot and you have a chem warmer in it it's gonna be much warmer it just it keeps that blood warm it just helps keep the blood circulating and the blood warmer so um you know we've found that the chem warmers just allow you to carry a lighter glove and also keep your hands warmer um we've done some orienteering stuff all winter and like a 20-hour event and we pretty much had them in our hands all the whole day and it just it's not optimal but it definitely is a lifesaver sometimes because my fingers I lose my fingers really fast when they're cold and it's pretty miserable so Mm -hmm. those have been pretty helpful um all right so that's all the required gear just to recap we've got wool fleece or synthetic hat a fleece long sleeve top waterproof jacket with a hood waterproof pants and then gloves or mittens so those are the five required clothing items mandatory gear everybody has to have those five items um at all times and don't play any games with like oh i'm gonna bring a toddler sized fleece because it's lighter uh like every single piece of clothing needs to be sized to fit you um so nice try but no toddler clothing or child's clothing unless you're one of our children racers um so we're gonna just we have a couple other kind of recommended gear items um let's see oh question first I assume our feet will be wet getting in and out of the river. Do we need something to keep our feet dry or warm? Question from David. Uh, just, I would say the most helpful thing is to tr- just, I mean, it's okay to think that your feet are going to stay dry and warm, but maybe the best thing is like mentally to just accept that they're probably not going to be dry and warm the whole race. Um, because you're right, getting in and out of the canoe, um you'll someone will get wet feet most likely maybe both people in each boat um so some strategies to keep your feet warm are very similar to what we talked about before like um, having kind of lightweight easily draining socks and shoes um if you know i've used chem warmers on my feet before if you know your toes get really cold um but then just keeping to wiggle them if they're wet in the boat Um, Just keeping your circulation going, and um, it'll be over pretty soon. Right, and and, and the thing is, is that, you know, your feet, the odds are strong that your feet might even be wet before you even get to the paddle. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's just say, hypothetically, if we decided that we'd have a trekking section before the paddle, um, we start at 8 o'clock in the morning, I think, or whatever the time is Mm going to be. Um, that time of year, there could potentially be some dew on the ground or potentially snow, potentially snow or frost um, and running through the grass. And it just doesn't take long for your feet to get wet either. But, you know, the thing is with your feet is you're always, if you just keep moving and keep, the other thing is just keep wiggling your toes and wiggling your fingers and, you know, do whatever you can to keep the blood flow. Um, the other thing we've also used is uh, kind of like, uh, the latex glove for the hands, um, you know, just kind of oh, like oh, a oh. little, we use often like, 
a dog poop bag that we just slide over our foot. And you can either go next to skin with the bag and then the sock over the top or sock and then bag and then shoe. Um, it really doesn't, it, I don't know that it really waterproofs anything, but it does help create that vapor barrier again that helps retain heat um, in the foot. Um, these have saved us more th many many times. So yeah. um, and they're light. They don't weigh anything. They don't they're weigh not anything, expensive. Not expensive. So there's some really good little game changing pieces of items that can make your race so much more variable, variable, and they don't really cost anything. So these are just trip. Tri these are things that took us a long time to learn, and so these are little things that we like to share with people. Mm -hmm. Um, so in addition to those five required gear items, um, there's probably won't recommend wearing just waterproof pants the whole race. Um, there's really other, no other required gear uh, item for your like bottom half. So you're going to have to figure out what you want to wear on your bottom half. So either um, do you wear some sort of shorts, like a triathlon short or a, bike, a cycling short? Um, or do you wear tights or trekking pants or kind of what, what's your strategy for your legs? Um, the first criteria is to have something that is 100% uh, coverage. So, um, I mean, maybe you do look really good in shorts running around and it looks super tough, but uh, we really recommend full coverage of your legs. So that means some sort of like tight all the way from your hips all the way down to your ankles. Um, that's to protect against any uh, briars, sticks, thorns, um, tripping over things in the woods and falling. It's just going to protect your skin from um, abrasion and cuts and scrapes. Um, and then also like what kind of shorts to wear uh, underneath. So we recommend a triathlon short if you are kind of used to that. It has a really, it's like a thin chamois if you can see that. It's uh, just um, thinner than a traditional biking only chamois and it's also designed to be uh, used soaking wet you know triathletes come out of the water and then they get on their bike and then they run all typically in the same pair of shorts so a uh, triathlon short would probably be your best bet um, for your next to skin layer um, and what, yeah anything else about dry shorts pants no like, the thing is is that everything you want is is just so that it like the lighter, lighter weight it is, the faster potentially will dry and not hold water. Um, is yeah. The best thing to keep in mind. So then over those tri shorts you could use to get your full coverage, you could use a pair of tights, um, just like a basic black pair of running tights or whatever color you want. If you have capri tights, you could pair them with uh, some calf sleeves. So then that gets your full coverage option. Um, and again, this isn't required. These are just what we would do. Um, and then also some people really like to wear trekking pants. So like the really lightweight, loose, uh, like a hiking pant. These are really great. Uh, mostly in the summer, they're easier to stay cool in, I think. Um, but in the winter too, they just really help uh, deflect any sort of, I mean, the briars and the burrs are still going to poke you. But at least with these pants, um, they'll just brush away against your skin um instead of like clinging to you the entire race um so that's an option for pants um question do you rubber band the bag in place over your foot oh um so mark's asking about the dog poop bags um so this is you know if it's really cold and you're worried about your feet getting cold you put your foot in here bare and then put your sock on over it and we generally don't use a rubber band up pretend this is my ankle. We wouldn't use a rubber band up here, um, but if you just have like a tall enough sock, like a four inch or seven inch cuff sock, that cuff will kind of hold this in place. And it won't be perfect, like it's gonna move around a little bit and it does feel a little funny when you're running around on plastic bags, um, but it does help keep that uh, a little bit of heat next to your skin. Um, and keep them from freezing. But if you're using the old classic wonder bag, uh -huh. Red bag is the foot. You yeah, know, that was pretty common to see a rubber band used with those. So, yep. if you want to use a rubber band, you can, but uh, not nice. 
what how we set it up we normally don't but i have seen many rubber bands in my day <laughs> yes um okay i kind of feel like that's it for tonight we're like out of uh we've talked about all the items in our little on our table here um so maybe we'll i'll just kind of open the floor i know you guys have been really great about asking questions so if anyone has any last minute questions tonight um go ahead and type those in um but yeah again we just have uh kind of some the main points from tonight were uh <laughs> we've sprung the announcement that we get to paddle with bikes in boats this year so um we're really excited about that I know it's a big challenge for our racers, um, but we're confident that you can meet the challenge. Um, again, just take a big deep breath when you're starting to paddle, make sure you're happy with how your equipment is organized in your canoe, um, and then set off down the river and enjoy it. Um, and then for paddling, or for clothing, I'm sorry, uh, make sure to review the gear list that's on the race website. It's slightly updated for 2020, um, but actually made a little bit easier so we took some of the gear items out of that required gear list um, so now we're down to five mandatory pieces of clothing per racer um, those are mandatory to carry the entire race um, each racer needs to have those items um, the uh, ooh, questions yes one second okay Katie the website mentions a puffy jacket will work in place of a fleece is that still true yes that is still true. You, yeah, so the, the, the thing is, is with the puffy jacket, you wanna make sure that it's synthetic and not down, mm -hmm. uh, because a, down, a wet down jacket uh, is not always optimal. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they'll still warm you, but uh, uh, you know, I would maybe kind of lean more towards more of a synthetic. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, is that, you know, we have, I guess I haven't spent as much time with the gear list as Emily has, is, we have shortened the gear list, but I think the stuff that was mandatory is now moved to a recommended, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and just because it's not mandatory doesn't mean that it might not be a good idea to have it. Very and true. so, you know, kind of keep an eye on those. Um, most active people do have a lot of the stuff already, um, you know, running tights, those kind of things. Um, you know, and, that, and then um, we'll have a much better idea what the weather is going to be looking like. Um, closer to the race week um, and so you know if you have any questions then reaching out um, I guess we used to do a class like the, a week or two before the race but we're not doing we, we've moved everything up but um, just don't be afraid to reach out with any gearing clothing questions because clothing is probably one of the most important things to make your day as enjoyable as possible if you can regulate your temperature and, and you know nobody likes to be cold all day right uh, i don't but you know <laughs> uh it's just one of those things that you know it might minimize some of the misery if we um, if you have the proper clothing uh, okay well, looks like one last question from mark although while we're answering it if anyone has more questions just type them in this is one of my favorite questions so mark wants to know do you wear underwear underneath the tri short typically and the reason this is my favorite question is because when I started uh, biking, this was uh, actually was introduced to cycling by my coworkers, and I didn't really know what I was doing. So I wore underwear underneath my cycling shorts for a good year, maybe two, maybe two years. And uh, it just happens that all of my coworkers were male at the time and they did not point this out to me. Maybe it was too awkward. I don't know. Um, and then I actually like was talking to a lady at a cycling event and she's like, um, I don't mean to be weird, but you're wearing underwear. Like you're not really supposed to do that. I was like, oh, okay. Good to know. Um, so the answer is no <laughs> underwear in between your skin and your cycling short or your triathlon short. Um, what we do recommend is this, uh, the chamois that's in a triathlon or cycling short. Um, you can use a, sh a chamois cream. There's lots of different brands. And just put that cream on the chamois and that'll help uh, reduce any friction um, between your skin and the chamois. But these are designed to, use, to be worn next to skin. Um, no underwear necessary. Anything else? Okay. Awesome questions, everybody. Um, 
Thank you for asking about underwear. I love answering that because it's just something that um, we want. We're here for you. No question is too, um, too awkward. We're here for it. So yeah, we'll uh, wrap our class up. We'll end this live broadcast. Um, and then it should be up on YouTube probably tomorrow. It'll stay on the Facebook event page until the event is over. Um, so can't wait to see you next week. Same time, same place, our basement slash Facebook. Um, we'll be back at Monday night at 7 p.m. Central. And next week we're talking about uh, cycling or mountain biking and teamwork strategies. So um, you can think up your questions all week and then be ready to meet us back here on Monday at 7. All right, have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you later.